Hello and welcome to the Google Podcast with myself, Rob Watson. And in this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with the editor of Positive News Magazine, Lucy Purdy. So I went down to London for the day and had a really good chat with Lucy and talked about the, all about the magazine and her background as well, how she got into it, it's particularly being you know, disillusioned in mainstream media and, and how she's pretty much got the best job in journalism right now as far as i'm concerned anyway so yeah i hope you guys enjoy this episode it was a really fun one to be involved in especially as i mentioned positive news a few times in my first episode so to get the chance such early on um, in doing this podcast for me to to interview someone from positive news was absolutely amazing so i'm really excited to be putting this one out there hope you guys enjoy it so without further ado we'll get into the episode Thanks for having me along today to come down and see you. Really it's appreciate it. You. You. So then, Lucy, for our listeners who aren't aware of Positive News, if you could just give a little bit of an overview of what the publication's all about, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So um, online and in print, Positive News um, publishes good journalism about the good things that are happening in the world. So while much of the kind of mainstream media focuses on the things that are going wrong, the problems, the challenges that the world faces... We, we want to kind of add to the debate and to um, publish stories about what's going well. So we, we write stories about progress, about possibility um, and about the potential solutions that people are working on that can kind of help tackle some of the major global challenges really that the world faces. Um, yes, so we publish stories about all, all different kind of, kinds of topics, so environmental, maybe social issues, things like that. We often um, feature maybe businesses who are doing inspiring things or individuals whose work's making a real kind of, um, having a real really big effect on the world or sometimes social enterprises, charities, that that kind of thing. So it's a real range of topics really, but yeah, our approach is to focus on what's going well, what's going right, as well as what's going wrong. That sounds amazing. And in terms of how long have you actually been involved with Positive News yourself? Yeah, so I've been editor for two years, just coming up to two years now. Um, But before that, I was a freelance journalist. So I got involved with Positive News not not too long after I went freelance. I started writing for them, doing a bit of proofreading, sub-editing, things like that, and basically got gradually more and more involved. Yeah, it's actually an amazing publication. I think I could only imagine um, the excitement that you can sort of have. It's kind of got like a real purpose, a real meaning for you personally to get up each day to know that you're contributing in such a way. Um, well, to make a positive effect must must feel pretty good. It does, yeah. It's it's a really cool job to have in journalism because I, I kind of came from the, I guess, quite a traditional route into journalism, which was to go to university and then to do a college course in journalism and then I started working in local newspapers to begin with so in Warwickshire and then up in North London and yeah so my training was kind of really focused around quite a traditional approach you know holding power to account um, exposing wrongdoing things like that which is are obviously you know hugely important parts of what journalism is but um, yeah after a while at working in local papers I, I got I became a little bit disillusioned with that way of doing things um, kind of always looking to catch people out or to kind of show what people were doing wrong. Um, And then I went freelance to kind of look for a bit more of an inspiring way of doing things. So basically followed my nose a little bit at that point, started writing about the kinds of things that just felt interesting to me personally. So I wrote quite a lot about the environment, um, stories to do with people's connection with nature, growing food, things like that. Um, And yeah, and became more and more inspired on on writing about what was going well and, and the solutions. And then basically came across positive news around that time and was like pretty astounded by the, the publication, just reading it, felt quite inspired um, and yeah, was was really kind of pleased to to be part of that and to, to have an impact. And yeah, like you say, it's really inspiring every day to work with these kinds of stories because I think as much as um, readers, consumers of news and we'll probably come on to talk about this, but you know, as much as reading and, and watching negative news has an impact on them, I think as, as journalists as well, writing the news and bringing these stories together and sharing them, I think that writing, um, sorry, using stories that are more kind of solutions focused, it has a real impact on journalists' well-being as well. And yeah, I think it's probably one of the best jobs in journalism to have, really. So, yeah, really. I could imagine. <laughs> I haven't can really think about it from a journalist's point of view in the past, because obviously, just maybe if you switch on the news and get bombarded with it. Yeah. 
But um, yeah, to just be constantly, like say who's who's working at news at ten and is doing the nightly news every night, just constantly repeating, yeah, like the negative stuff that's going on. It's yeah. just going to be seeping into them all the time. Yeah, and exactly. create that world view for them. Yeah, I think it does, and um, we, we certainly get a lot of people coming to our publication, you know, having maybe Googled positive news or, you know, inspiring news, and a lot of people actually say that they've completely switched off from watching or reading the news, because they just feel like they can't cope with that constant bombardment. Um, I think I think it's a very interesting balance, because obviously journalism has, has long served a really important purpose, like I mentioned before, you know, holding power to account and exposing negligence or wrongdoing they're all really hugely important social functions but um here at positive news we just feel like the the kind of overwhelming negativity bias actually what it does is creates an unbalanced view of reality um i think it makes people feel quite disempowered often maybe a sense of hopelessness that the world is just you know getting worse, you know, it's bad and getting worse and, and there's nothing much they can do about it but the response we get to our magazine is that people feel like they can be um, they can be informed about what's going on in the world but they can do that they can do that in a way that also leaves them feeling inspired and able to make a difference as well Yeah, absolutely, that sounds it does must does sound really good and I think definitely that's for me as well I, I just shifted away from the news it almost felt, if you'd have the radio on it kind of felt like every hour you're getting brainwashed just for a few minutes and it was like <laughs> I need to turn off from this and um, yeah it just like will I'll send to dip in and out of the, new, the positive news magazine maybe on a Sunday here and there yeah and the boost that you'll get from just hearing about stuff yeah and I think the key thing is I think I, I saw this quote that you had on um, on one of your social media feeds is like you know I'm proud to be working on an alternative which is basically informing people but inspiring them too mm. and yeah. I think that's the key thing you know if we keep seeing all this negative stuff that's going on in the world and there's no solutions or we don't empower people then it's just going to go one way but if we can lead them down a way and then make, give them tools or techniques or mm. anything yeah. that is going to make them feel like oh, I can do something about this even if it's just a, the smallest of things like I noticed in the recent publication like the ripple effect of like do small actions make an effect yeah so the the cover story of the, the latest issue um, we called it the ripple effect do small actions matter so this was really, we just thought this was quite an interesting topic um, at a time of you know, seemingly overwhelming kind of global challenges. It, do the you know, small actions that we're sometimes prompted to take in our everyday lives, like recycling or um, you know, small acts of kindness, like helping a neighbour in need, that kind of thing, do they actually make a difference? Um, or are they kind of just pointless against this, you know, these huge kind of big challenges? So we spoke to some some experts from the likes of Action for Happiness, from a new kind of pro-social um, website also called Good and Kind, and really put this question to, the, to, to these people. Um, and yeah, the, the consensus was that we kind of need both, that we need kind of fundamental changes within existing structures of government and, and in society, um, and for things to change from the top, but that also grassroots kind of actions on an individual or community level can really add up as well and, and really... Um, really make a difference and it was really an, quite an inspiring topic to delve into because I think lots of people lots of our readers in particular might grapple with that you know I really want to have a positive social impact but how do I do it is it yeah. isn't it just a drop in the ocean so yeah it's an interesting topic to explore it feels like it, it has to sort of start in some ways with the individual for us of course we'd love corporations and the government to be making these step changes um, but I feel like we've just got to do our bit and I think as noticed in the article about you actually just start to feel better in yourself and you just have this you know even if it doesn't feel like it's had a huge impact but I think it was the guy who, who wrote the article said he wrote a letter to his friend instead yeah. Yeah. and his friend was a little bit like what? Why? why have you written why did you bother <laughs> it feels a bit weird yeah. but then his partner seen it and then she wrote a letter onto someone else so exactly. it does have an impact doesn't it I think that's the thing that you, it's, it's the same with publishing the magazine as well you don't always know what impact putting those stories out there is going to have in the same way that if you, you know, you might cook a meal for a neighbour in need or you might hold the door open for someone, give them a smile when they're, you know, don't look too happy and you never really know what impact that, that kind of action is going to have. But certainly with positive news, we get contacted quite a lot from, we get contacted, sorry, by readers who have, you know, just explained that reading a story maybe years ago 
um, had an inf- had an impact on them, got them to set up something, a business or a charity, or to take some sort of action in their life, which then did have a ripple effect. Um, I got um, a message from somebody the other day on on Twitter, I think it was, saying that the magazine for her was like a bottle of oxygen <laughs> in a, a kind of time when you know much of the debate online and in the media is quite kind of toxic. So that felt really inspiring. Yeah, that's amazing. It must be nice to hear those stories. And I think actually with me starting this podcast, it's just that article in a way sums up perfectly what I'm looking to sort of get that message out there of how we can empower ourselves just to yeah. make some small changes and, yeah. and they can tend to turn big. And I think it was mentioned in the article as well is that, okay, you start small, but then you also you push wider as well. Maybe you get in part of a rally or you get in touch, get in touch with your local MP or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, or start an online petition campaign, whatever that may be. Yeah. But if you can just start small with maybe picking up that piece of litter outside your house. Yeah, it's something in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really interesting as well because I feel like we've, we've noticed that within the story of positive news itself. So this is our 25th year in print this year. Um, and when, when our founder set it up, you know, it started as a kind of leaflet, I think, on her kitchen table, a very small thing, and gradually grew into the publication that we have today. Um, but it's really interesting now that the wider um, industry in journalism is actually taking much much more note of the approach that we follow, which we call within the industry constructive journalism. So now it's being picked up by major kind of news outlets such as the BBC and the Huffington Post and the Guardian, who have um, a section called the Upside. Yeah. So it's really kind of inspiring from our point of view. We've we've been doing this for a long time, and and we've. Um, We've kind of long believed in its purpose, but now the journalism, I think, is at a point in terms of funding, but also just where we are socially, that journalists and editors and even publishers are looking at ways to do things differently. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're also super pleased because we, we've got into WH Smith's um, selected Smith stores and selected Sainsbury's stores as well for the first time this year. So it's really lovely to see the magazine there on the shelves alongside kind of, you know, mainstream news outlets. Um, and also just to see the growing appetite, really, for positive news, yeah, both within the industry and without. And, yeah, it's definitely going in a really inspiring direction from that small action that our founder took, you know, two and a half decades ago. Yeah, they would have <laughs> never had any expectations that it maybe would have even been around 25 years later, let alone maybe into some, you know, W. H. Smiths and other yeah. places and getting a good readership. It feels like it's there's a real wave of behind the need for this now and I think particularly in the younger generations they're kind of waking up and being like yeah. this doesn't feel right what I'm, what we're kind of we're absorbing and we need this publication and many other things as well like you're talking about that action for happiness and other things and people are definitely looking to switch off from the bad stuff and to be switching more onto the good stuff. I think you're right yeah I think there's much more of awareness that the what the mainstream media often focuses on is a really, uh, effectively a really narrow kind of section of, of what's happening in the world. Um, and I think you, you're right, people want to be able to do something about the problems that they're, that they're facing in the world. Um, they want to kind of look forward and they don't just want to be passive. They want to um, take some action and, and, yeah, look beyond that doom and gloom, really. So in terms of, um, I can see that you've done, you know, you've written for quite a lot of different publications for certain things, you know, whether it be to do with the environment and growing food and the natural world and social change. Was there a particular, like, trigger point for you that shifted you to go down to be more conscious route or was, or was it from you being in the, the, the old style of the industry that kind of did that for you? Yeah, it was, it was a real mixture. Like I said, I, I worked in local journalism and, and for some really good kind of traditional campaigning kind of local newspapers as well, especially up in North London. Um, so I, I covered Haringey, the borough of Haringey, when I was a reporter, which was a, a fantastic kind of opportunity. It's such an um, interesting borough. So I covered things like the baby pee tragedy um, and we, we ran campaigns to save local health services, that kind of thing. So I was, I was kind of really aware of the potential power that journalism could have to bring about change. But then, like I said, it was also a slight sense that it was a little bit at odds with um, probably myself, my personality. You know, I kind of tend to see the good in people and to want to draw out people's potential as opposed to always trying to hammer them, you know, with questions. Although that is a really important, important part of journalism as well. So I think for me it was... Um, 
positive news is a brilliant kind of way of fusing those two things. So it's using using the power of journalism. And I, I should say in the magazine that our um, approach is not to kind of it's not to put a smile on people's faces. It's not supposed to be kind of happy journalism or to make people just feel better in the moment. But it's it's tackling really kind of important and often very difficult subjects, but with that slightly different um, mindset of what's going right, but with not lacking any of the kind of rigor or fact checking, or um, yeah, you know, holding things up to scrutiny that that journalism traditionally did. So positive news just feels like a really great way to do both, really, to write about what I find inspiring, what our readers find inspiring but to do it in a really kind of compelling um, and, yeah, authoritative way as well. So you must have um, interviewed some amazing people during your time and stuff and put out some amazing stories. Is there any particular ones that kind of, like, stand out for you as some real highlights? I'm sure there's, you know, most of them, but is there anything? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, we've, we don't tend in Positive News to, to interview kind of big names. <laughs> in fact, we put Russell Brand on the cover once last year which was a bit of a departure for us we felt like he he was kind of a really interesting individual who had um obviously a huge public profile but was also doing really interesting things in terms of the way he was trying to reach out to young people and bringing conversations about spirituality and things like that into the mainstream so he was a super interesting interviewee and he was really um he was really kind of up for what we're doing actually which was really cool But often the people that I've interviewed who I found really inspiring are not well known at all. They're just kind of ordinary people working on their their own thing. Um, One that springs to mind is for an issue last year we interviewed for young conservationists. So we did a a beautiful kind of photo-led piece about them and asked them, they're basically four teenagers from different parts of the UK who are just really, really passionate about nature and wildlife and protecting it. and not, not doing so necessarily in a kind of, oh, you know, we're losing all these species, it's, it's terrible, which of course it is, that's a big, a big part of where conservation is at now. But their, basically their passion and their love for wildlife just really shone through. And they talked about things like how they try and use social media, for example, to spread word of, of what's happening, to try and inspire that love in, in other people their own age. So we just felt like they were really inspiring. Um, and then another one that springs to mind is um, I interviewed, again I think it was last year, a series of um, former far-right extremists. So they were people who had <clears throat> been involved in kind of basically neo-Nazi groups um, and in some cases had, had you know, committed acts of violence and you know, hate speech and so on, but they had basically decided that they didn't want to live their lives that way anymore and had left the movement. And the reason we spoke to them was because they were they're part of a network called the Formers, so called Formers, which is basically trying to help other people who are still currently in those kinds of groups find a way out, and um, kind of create new identities outside of these previous hate-filled lives. So they were super inspiring because you know they were really holding themselves up to scrutiny in terms of their past behaviour, but were still saying, you know, if I've done it, maybe you can too. There's there's another way to be. Yeah, well, one of my highlights as well from the, it was um, the article with Ron Finley, oh, cool. who's over yeah. in like LA, the Gorilla Gardener. Yes, yes. He's, I mentioned him in my first podcast, and um, it's just so inspiring. I remember watching his TED talk and then yeah. seeing it, and the photography that you had in there as well yeah. was um, so good. And I just love the idea that he is, um, you know, people be out, say, protesting. He's like, well, you can go protest. What I'll do is I'm going to dig up some land and grow yeah. some food and we're going to do yeah. it in a community led minded so yeah um, yeah he was fantastic I remember interviewing him I think it was probably a quite a, a rainy day here and opened up my Skype and he was munching his uh, muesli in <laughs> sunny LA and he's just yeah he's such an inspiring guy because he's just completely himself but he, he just feels this really real affinity to help other people in, in where he lives which is quite a, a poor kind of um, area of LA that's got a lot of social problems and it's, it's really impoverished but um, I think he just feels this this real kind of calling to grow vegetables and to spread this word about um, you know nature and how connecting with it can enrich people's lives. We interviewed Ron in fact for a feature about um, re- looking at different ways to be a man so it was um, about redefining masculinity basically and he was basically included because he thinks that being a being a, a real man in this day and age is looking after the planet is like inspiring you know your community those kinds of things um so yeah the the idea of turning the the gangster kind of cliche on its 
on its head really into into a new kind of more inspiring um form was really interesting yeah he was really cool yeah that is um what is, is it a term like gardening is gangster yeah or that's what it's and just yeah. Like, yeah and he's got the part the look you know you can see him he's going to inspire yeah tons of people yeah um, and, and none of it's false at all with him it's you know he's just a really kind of he's just really himself but I think that's what really shines through and particularly for the young people that he works with he's a really you know compelling role model <laughs> to put it in a, in, in a funny kind of way but he, he, he just speaks from the heart and, and his actions come from the heart and I think that's what that's what has drawn a lot of people along with him so in terms of um, when you're looking to, as editor, looking for new articles and how to, how to, who to put into the next publications, do you have like general themes for stuff or you just sort of, you go after what, something that feels right that you think your readers are going to enjoy? Yeah, it's, it, to be honest, it's largely done by instinct at the moment. Um, we, we have a really big um, and growing network of freelance journalists around the world. So they pitch stories to us from you know, what's happening in their corner of the world or their specialist area of interest. So some of the articles come from those ideas, but some of them come from just what we think is um, you know, exciting and inspiring that's going on. So sometimes that will be, OK, the, the mainstream media reports something this way. How can we report it um, in another way to kind of draw out the more inspiring constructive elements of it um but yeah obviously we also get contacted by a lot of organizations and businesses and individuals who are doing cool things and who think that they're what they're doing has a place in the magazine so it's it's largely done by instinct we don't we don't tend to theme the issues as they come together but often a theme kind of magically emerges <laughs> of some sort but um yeah it's, it's nice being quarterly because we have quite a bit of time to kind of really plan and um yeah, just just pick a wide range of stories. We try and um, try and cover di- obviously lots of different types of topics that are going to draw different people in. Um, and also in in the magazine, we try and have a different um, format as well. So we have lots of kind of smaller listicle articles sometimes, which is maybe you know three uh, three organisations doing a cool thing in this in this area. And then we we also do some in depth features and in depth interviews, which hopefully really go into a particular topic in lots of depth. So yeah, mixture. No, that's really good to get that sort of understanding because for me as the reader, I'm just you know I can see there's a varied um, approach to it, and there's a good mix of things, whether it be environmental or social or something you know whatever's going on, a positive effect in the prisons. I think it was something in there last year about um, introducing park runs into the oh, into yeah. the prison systems and stuff. That's right. Um, yeah. So just like it's good, that, that's good to hear. And I like the fact that you say it's like intu- based on your intuition, you know, going with that almost what your gut feels and, yeah. and go yeah. that rather than it have this strict formula or set way of doing it. Yeah. Probably gives you an option then to be more flexible and fluid with how you then take things further forward. That's true. Yeah. It's a good it's a good kind of acid test sometimes in the office just to say, oh this is happening, what do you guys think about that? And it's either like, oh, you know, we, that's cool, but we've maybe heard about that before or it's not that new. But sometimes when there's a story that people are like have the response of, oh that's really interesting, oh cool, you know, and imagining how that would change things if it was applied on a larger or wider scale that's a really good sign that it's a story that's going to resonate with our readers as well. That sounds great. So kind of a, away from your post news and, and your writing for that, you've obviously written for a lot of other publications like Woodland Trust, um, the per- Permaculture Magazine and stuff, so it seems to be a real, um, like a bit of an eco-warrior, maybe a new person. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, when I, when I was freelance, like I said, when I left local newspapers, I just kind of followed my nose and the, the topics that really fascinated me were, like I said, the environment, the natural world, and particularly growing food, which I absolutely love. So, yeah, I wrote for people like the Sustainable, um, the Guardian Sustainable Business section, and for magazines like The Simple Things, O Comely magazine, um, and for a lot of growing kind of titles as well, because that was just what really inspired me. Yeah, I, I grew up in rural Shropshire, so um, I'm a bit of a country girl at heart, and I've always been surrounded by kind of food growing. And, and one thing that for some reason I absolutely love is composting. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a compost heap at home in a small garden, even though I live in London, which is super lucky. And um, I actually take the compost from this building as well, where, where our office is based, and take it home every night on the tube. So, yeah, if you see me, it's probably wise not to sit too close. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that actually really helps as well in, in kind of media, which is often a really kind of busy and deadline driven world and for a small team when we're on deadline it can feel quite exhausting so having the garden and growing things and yeah composting really helps me 
kind of keep that balance and keep a connection with you know I guess the earth and and yeah helps tap into my purpose on a personal level as well and keep me going keep me inspired yeah I was going to come to that about in terms of what you would do to switch it off because even though it's positive news sometimes we can still regardless of whatever news it's it's still it can become information overload yeah that's and definitely true even if you know I could read if I read six hours of positive news stuff each day <laughs> I'd, it's going to be you know I'm going to short circuit something along yeah. the line so it's, yeah you need to get the balance right so that's good to know so in terms of um so you're, you're a bit of a gardener then yourself then as well, is it? so you do all your mulching and stuff with your, your yeah, compost? I do, yeah, I, I do love that kind of thing and um, I think it's really inspiring actually to be in London and to, and to still do things like that because uh, the more you look, the more there are loads of pockets of little green and there's some really cool, obviously, growing projects, particularly community-run ones in London, so that really helps. Yeah, I also love running um, and done a few marathons in the last few years and training for, wow. for things like that really, really helps actually because it's nice to have that enforced time of I really need to get out and go and run and just kind of clears clears the old brain and yeah again gives me more energy to keep going. Yeah it's a it's an amazing thing going out running. What sort what marathons have you done? So I, I, I've done the Brighton Marathon, I did the Loch Ness last year which was my favourite one ever, it was fantastic. And then I did one in in Wales on the on the kind of coastal on a coastal path as well earlier this year. Wow! So, yeah. Amazing. I'm not particularly fast, but I do I do love it. I love it for the yeah the sense of space that it gives me. I think in my mind, um, and yeah, it's good to have a, a goal to aim for. I haven't got anything booked in at the moment, which is why I'm being quite lazy and haven't been for a while. But oh, that's okay. I am um, <laughs> I'm in a running club myself, and. Um, one of the guys I was chatting with this year, he actually went up. His first marathon was the Loch Ness one. Really? And he said it was absolutely amazing. I think he read about it in a in a magazine or something. He said just the scenery yeah. is something else. It's, it's really beautiful. It's really beautiful. You have to kind of remember to look, but you basically run down the whole, one of the whole kind of sides of the loch, and it's it's amazing. Yeah, I didn't spot the Nessie, but um, that's what's next time. Yeah, maybe next time. <laughs> yeah, I've not done a marathon. I've done a half marathon, but I've not... Um, not ventured further than that at the moment to be honest um but yeah maybe we'll see i'd love to be able to do the new york one at mm. some point i believe that's a on most people's bucket list yeah i think um supposedly when you run across the bridges it's meant to be like 40 mile an hour headwinds in wow. <laughs> so although i'm not i'm not not near any out to that yet but <laughs> now that's really good to know and i noticed that um you are involved in the homeless world cup as well yeah well i have been yeah, yeah. so that was back when i was freelance um so yeah that's a Probably a good example, actually, of the kind of thing that we might cover in the magazine. So the Homers World Cup is, as you might um, guess from the title, a football tournament for people who are, or I think who have previously been homeless. And it's a global competition. So I went out when they held it in Amsterdam, which was a few years ago now, and basically managed the social media for that year. But um, it was super inspiring, like meeting some of the players and hearing their stories of, you know, the real kind of hardship that they've endured but um also learning about what they've kind of learned from it what how they've managed to grow from you know being in that having that really really difficult experience and then in in their case you know how sport has become a bit of a focus for change for them and the opportunities they've got from it um but yeah it was incredible it was such a such a busy kind of week with different um I just remember kind of walking through and there being like a team from Mexico over there doing some kind of ritual, a team from Africa doing some crazy dance over here and just the atmosphere throughout the matches and it was just amazing. It's a really, really cool event. It sounds amazing. I remember hearing about the last one. I think the next, the next one's in Mexico. Um, I think so. Um, I, think so. I think it's in next month. And um, yeah, it's just so humbling and people can sort of feel like more of a connection rather than, you know, you watch the, the other World Cup that's recently passed and, you know, the players are earning £200,000 a week and yeah. <laughs> there's absolutely complete disconnection to any sort of life. But then, you know, we'll see, particularly in London or cities in Manchester, you can see a lot of homeless people. Mm. And to see how people have got themselves either off the street and to be able to do something like that, then, you know, yeah. it's just a really good story, isn't yeah, it? And it's a really inspiring. great event. Um, so that must have been amazing to be to yeah, be involved it was, in. That's great. Um, so in terms of, um, so yeah, you would um, running and gardening. Do you have any sort of a, sort of like maybe daily rituals that you might do to sort of help keep you focused and um, and you know yeah in a, in a good place to be able to come into work and, and do your best. 
So I'd say they're, they're probably the ones I would mention, really. It's, it's having that kind of time outside to reflect, to get away from the computer screen um, and to kind of reconnect with what really makes me feel happy and inspired inside. So that's the gardening. Um, and then it's, it's not really a ritual, but part of, part of what we do here is um, being lucky enough to hear back from readers. So I mentioned this before, but we often get letters and messages from people which, which actually really help on when I'm having a, you know, a busy day or having a hard day at work. So pe- people kind of say things like they've followed Positive News, you know, since it was launched, you know, two decades ago, which is really inspiring. And like I mentioned before, people are just saying what an impact it's had on, on their lives and it's enabled them to see the world kind of slightly differently, um, maybe to have a bit more compassion or to have a bit more sense of empowerment that they can make a change. So on a day-to-day basis, those kind of messages really help. But just also speaking to journalists, obviously I, I commission a lot of journalists. I'm in touch with journalists and photographers and illustrators as well. And the response that we often get when we explain what the magazine is about is it's just cool, really cool, because people really want to be part of it. They feel like it's, uh, it's kind of what the world needs. Um, so yeah, the, the job can be hard work with a small team, but there's there's plenty to keep me going and to keep me keep me inspired in the job as well yeah and in terms of with the publication it's also like aesthetically really well done like oh, visually a great looking magazine um so and I imagine yeah that's probably another reason why you know um people would want to come and contribute on it as well because of that as well and it all goes into the mix um, yeah des- design's really important to us so we, we um i don't think i mentioned this but a few years ago we actually ran a crowdfunding campaign and to become a cooperative so we're now owned by 1500 of our readers so that was that's a kind of interesting thing about what we're doing as well because we're we've got a different kind of ownership structure which is quite kind of pioneering so it was a way to grow as an organization and to to kind of be able to work towards financial sustainability but we also wanted to do it in a way that wasn't um, we didn't kind of <clears throat> need a big corporation or a, maybe a, a wealthy proprietor like some of the media I could mention <laughs> has so um, that was really cool and after we did that and we, we, we kind of transferred to this new ownership we relaunched as a magazine so previous to that we were in newsprint um, but in, in the new kind of new publication design we felt was like a really important part of it as well we didn't want this to be some kind of apologetic kind of niching we wanted to come out bold and say you know this is a this is a different way to report on what's going on in the world Um, and we get loads of great feedback about the design actually we hope that it will mean that people you know keep the issues don't throw them away have them on their coffee tables that kind of thing and that they they sort of stay out there and get get seen by more and more people which is our ultimate aim really to spread this journalism as far as we can that's absolutely amazing to hear about the crowdfunding and you know you get about 1500 people are now classed as the um co-owners, own, co-owners yeah, of the exactly. um of the magazine yeah that's amazing. i love that the way you've gone on that because keeps you independent keeps you exactly. so you can keep um doing what you want to do and not feel like you've got pressure from whoever that may be yeah um, yeah so yeah, so editorially we're we're independent. The um, the co-owners, however, have a the right among among other things, but one is to elect to the board of directors for Positive News, so they can kind of say who they want to represent their interests onto our board. Um, so yeah, it's, it just makes perfect sense to us that the people who we're there to serve, you know, we're we're also democratically kind of accountable to them. So it makes a lot of sense as a as a business structure and also as you probably know loads of journalistic publications are experimenting with at the moment you know new ways to be funded because obviously the traditional um excuse me ad driven revenue model is is really crumbling (laughs) so we we were one of the first to take such a kind of bold um approach to that and it's it's really paid off um yeah. <laughs> and I just took, you just picked on on there is about, you know, um, you took a bold approach and it's paid off. And I think that's a, a key thing I think a lot of us can take away from stuff is like, if you kind of, is it, what's, is it an Einstein quote or something? It's like, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, it's like it's the definition of insanity or something. Mm-hmm. So you've got to look, you've almost got to go above it yeah. and then find new ways and stuff. So, and often the new ways may have not been done before. Mm. So, but if you, you guys like intuition based and go, if you go with it, it's, so often that it'll literally pay off yeah, you know absolutely. going down that route absolutely yeah 
So, in terms of influences in your life, who, who would you say has had like a you know the greatest positive influence in you personally, whether it be growing up or there's someone that inspires you who might be the other side of the world or it's a book or what you know? That's a really good question. Um, so, I would say as a journalist, I'm really inspired by people who who write about kind of really timely, important issues, but they do so with a lot of heart and passion. So. I think of people like um, George Monbiot, the journalist and author who, who, as you probably know, wrote a book called Feral, all about rewilding and the positive potential in, in rewilding. So that, that book really inspired me. Um, so it was very kind of impassioned. So it was, it was kind of journalism because obviously he's, he's an investigative journalism. As, you know, he's very up on fact, fact-based kind of reporting and, and checking everything out and exploring the limitations, obstacles and so on. But he also manages to get a lot of his personal kind of passion in there as well and, and heart. So he's inspiring. Um, also writers like Re- Rebecca Solnit, who, again, she writes about really often tricky issues like, you know, environmental collapse and climate change and human rights abuses, things like that. But she... She writes about them in a really kind of human way. Um, she puts herself, a lot of her heart into them. And she, I think she, I get from her writing that she has a, she has the possibility within herself to um, think that things might change for the better. That really comes across. So she's kind of, she's, you know, in a, in a way she's totally immersed in all these difficult, tricky subjects. But there's a sense that she can have her mind changed or that she can, imagine a future where things might be done differently and I think that really comes across to me and it's really inspiring but then um, more generally honestly it's, it's kind of a positive news it's the people that we interview the, the people who feature in these stories um, and, and a lot of them have, have been doing amazing things without like you say without any real role models or you know patterns of, of this could be done they're kind of forerunners or pioneers or you know they've just kind of taken a, a seed of an idea and they've kind of run with it so they're, they're super inspiring. Um, yeah, I think I'd say that. <laughs> no, that's great. That's good to hear that. Um, the influence that you've had. And, you know, I'm sure at some point maybe I'll ask someone else so down the line and, and you'll be one of the, the, the positive influences <laughs> in their be lives. Very cool. <laughs> um, well, it already will be in terms of the publication and stuff and um, oh, what thanks. you're doing. So, um, yeah, and in terms of um, what else would you do maybe with your downtime and stuff? Is there any things that, else that will keep you inspired? Maybe any interesting TED Talks or podcasts or, or anything like that you kind of you maybe will check in on regularly? So, yeah, there, I mean, there are that I look at for in kind of terms of work and for getting a sense of what other people are doing, what's kind of inspiring, who, who are the new people talking about new interesting things. But honestly, when I get home, I kind of want to switch off a little bit <laughs> so I, I tend to um I, I love things like cooking like for me that's just such a relaxing brilliant thing to do and it obviously ties in with growing food as well so um I love using like lovely seasonal organic ingredients and cooking up lovely dishes things like that yeah no, no one else nothing really springs to no. mind because honestly when I switch off I'm kind of off from work yeah, well, and that feels like a work thing yeah so. I can imagine because you get so much good stuff and like you know the people yeah. you'll be speaking with every day or interviewing yeah. and stuff like that you're getting you certainly getting a great dose of inspiration that's the thing P- people often ask me where do you get your story ideas from you know do you, do you struggle to find positive stories and the answer is definitely not like I feel like there's there's so much out there to be reported on and we can only cover as a as a small magazine and a, you know we do publish online every day but we can only cover a tiny fraction of that so yeah I, n- I never struggle to fill the magazine there's never any shortage of inspiring things and yeah sometimes I just need to step out of that whole world to take a bit of time for myself <laughs> yeah I think that's so true there's one of the reasons for me doing this podcast and realize that there is so much good happening in the world mm. and there's so many inspiring people and stories yeah. that is happening and I think we can people can forget about that because they're not switched onto it mm. and it can be very much focused on Brexit or Trump and all these things yeah. which feel completely and totally overwhelming mm, um, so it's great to know that you've got tons more good stuff to be coming out yeah in, in certainly not ways. short of ideas yeah. <laughs> so this podcast is all about sharing um, the good of what people are doing like yourself what advice would you go out give someone who is looking to go out there and do their own bit of good in the world yeah, it's, it's a great question, and um, one that one thing that we often come back to with positive news is the power of story. Obviously, being a 
been a journalistic publication, but um, we know from the work that we do that stories are really powerful and that if you can frame the world in a negative or a positive way, that has an impact. So we would say, I mean, I would say, maybe try and think about the story that you're telling yourself about what might be possible or what you might be able to achieve and try and, um, as well as the obstacles that you might face or what might go wrong, come from a place of abundance and think what what might go really well as well and that if you have a really heartfelt passion for something there's likely lots of other people out there who would share that as well um so yeah we we believe through our journalism that it's possible to have a realistically optimistic approach to things so i guess that would be my advice to people would be to try and come from that place and then to take a first step and see what comes back that sounds great and i love the idea of having a more of an abundance mindset um, I think maybe a lot of us have maybe have adopted like a, a scarcity mindset mm. about yeah. things and when and that's why I think with the positive news and your response there is if people more people are reading this stuff and listening to this stuff they'll feel more inspired to go out and do something mm. they'll think like oh I'll do that but if it's if you've got the scarcity mindset and you're hearing about Brexit mm. you kind of will go into your shell and not feel like I'm going to go out and do that thing yeah. but I think yeah. yeah totally if you can just feel like anything's possible yeah give it a go i think one of the things as well is like what's the worst that can happen you know if you want to go if something that you're excited about doing and it feels good to you yeah nothing can really go wrong tap into it yeah definitely Mm. yeah and i I often have that um the thought coming into work on the tube in the morning when everyone's reading maybe you know the i won't mention it but the kind of (laughs) morning paper or or listening to the news on their headphones whatever i wonder how the world might look if more people read positive news or publications like ours, what impact that would have on people's sense of what is possible. Um, Because I think we could, together we could tell a much more inspiring story about what is possible for humanity, um, whether on an individual level or community level or as, you know, nations or as the whole world. Um, Yeah, the, the power of story I think is super important and it's something that I think we we've kind of accepted what's going on at the moment with the mainstream media but there are there are other ways to tell the stories about the world and there's there's a need I think a real need in society for it to be more realistic um, and to more accurately reflect you know what's really going on in the world which is lots of things are incredibly difficult lots of people are living really really difficult lives and there are huge problems that seem insurmountable but if we don't also shed light on what's going right or on the potential solutions or the people who are working to help others out of those situations that kind of thing then it feels like we might not get anywhere it's a Mm. really good place to start I think and that's what that's what feels right and what we do well I'd love next time I come to London when I get on the tube that (laughs) people are reading positive news magazine um rather than the free one that gets hanged out yeah Um, we're working on it (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, it's one step at a time, isn't it? Yeah, it's one step at a time. Definitely. So, well, that's you know, it's been amazing to talk to you today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, taking your time out, I know that you um, you know, you've got a lot of good things to be getting on with. <laughs> so, how can people connect with you and find out a little bit more about the magazine and how they could subscribe? Yeah, so we would love that. We, like I mentioned, we publish daily online, which is www.positive.news. So you can um, pick up our journalism there. But what we what would really, really help us as a um, media, media organisation is that people subscribed. So if you go to www.positive.news slash subscribe, you can, um, you can yeah, order your copies so you'd get four um, issues throughout the year. And, yeah, that's a really brilliant way to not only be inspired um, and feel empowered by the kind of news that you read, but it would also help um, kind of assure our future basically and keep on ensure that we can keep on publishing positive news to try and reach more and more people and i believe um you know christmas is coming up so you can gift subscriptions as well to people yeah, can't you exactly so we think that's a great present for someone who maybe someone who needs a bit of a nudge towards positivity in their life or just someone who who's interested in news and keeping abreast of what's going on but maybe wants to do so in, in a in a kind of unique way so yeah we offer gift subscriptions um and yeah, we've also got our social media channels on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, so you can keep up to date with, with our stories and what's going on there as well. That sounds amazing. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. It's I, been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Um, 